Hello, and welcome to Women in Manufacturing. I'm Lydia DiLiello, the CEO and founder of Capital Pricing Consultants, a revenue management consultancy. And I am delighted to be your host today for Women and Manufacturing, and am thrilled to have with us Lucia Falick from Butterball Farms. And we're going to talk about the whole Butterball idea, folks. So it is sort of what you think, but not totally. And we are so excited to have Lucia. She comes from the world of R&D and quality. And she brings it in a perspective that's really meaningful to all of us. So I hope that you're going to join us for this whole episode because Lucia is fantastic. So Lucia, to start, what makes your background different than anyone else's relative to quality and R&D? Well, thank you, Lydia. Thank you for having me. Um, I liked manufacturing since I was a little kid. I think I, I, I went to the Ford Motor Company with my dad when I was about six years old. And we went to Kellogg's here in Michigan, I think probably when I was nine. And I got kind of bitten by that bug of wanting to see how things were made and learn about that. And for some reason, when I went to, to school at Michigan State, I started studying nutrition. And I was in nutrition for like three years. And, and finally, I went to a counselor and said, I, I want to learn how food is made, how food is manufactured. Can you help me with that? And he put me in a different, different school, and I learned about food manufacturing and graduated with a, with a food science degree that I was able to use um, to get a job in food manufacturing. And that's where I've been. It's going to be 38 years this year. So it's, it's, it's a long history now. But that's doubly fantastic then for two reasons. So the first is you're one of the very rare people that I ever speak to who actually studied and is implementing what they studied. And then secondly, to have a career of 38 years where you have used that science and that degree and built upon that is tremendous. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing now at Butterball. And, and maybe the best place to start, Lucia, is Tell us the whole story behind Butterball, because I know when you and I first talked, the first thing that came to mind was, well, of course, it's just turkey. And you you expanded on that and enlightened me. Yeah, I like to think about it as a little bit of an icebreaker instead of kind of a pain, which is it's a little bit of both. The founder of our company, um, his name was Leo Peters. He, back in the day in the 50s or so, he invented uh, he was an inventor and he invented a flash freezing type process for, for meat products. And he, he had a relationship with some of the um, processors in the area. He ended up selling that IP to Swift, Swift and Company. And Swift and, and Leo organized this term butterball for, for the turkeys. And Leo asked to sort of put it on a royalty basis and use it just with butter products. Cause his next big idea was gonna be how to kind of form and shape butter into cool designs and logos and things like that. So, so he kind of rented that name back thinking probably that it would be, you know, no problem. And it's been kind of a problem <laughs> ever since cause we've been discussing it and highlighting it with customers and things like that. But it's the first question that everyone always asks. And so I can imagine that that even from an R&D and quality perspective, it gets all interwoven in there because of trademarks and all of that. Yep. So, so, but Butterball Farms is much more than just turkeys. It is a variety of food products. Is that right? So Butterball Farms is an, actually a flavor house. So we do, uh, we use butter and margarine and plant-based products and other kind of food bases, mayonnaise and so forth to, to season other folks' foods. So let's say for example, you're buying a, a meal kit for like maybe from, from Home Chef or from you know, the bigger companies that are selling meal kits. We are often the, the little portion that is in that kit that will season your chicken or your fish or your shrimp and so forth. So we're very kind of a narrow focus in terms of flavor enhancement for other folks' proteins. Okay. Um, nothing to do with turkey anymore. So, <laughs> well, so thank you for clarifying that yeah. for us because, it, like you say, it's a great icebreaker because everybody just makes the assumption butterball has to be turkey. Yeah, and I like to, you know, I like to discuss it, and it kind of gets the gets the mood rolling in terms of what we do and what we don't do. So, so talk a little bit about Lucia. 
your current role and, and what R&D means to you and, and how that's kind of formed your career over the years. Yeah, so I started in a restaurant company and I did, I did work a long time for them. It was a restaurant company that, <clears throat> that had, um, they made all the food in a central commissary. So if you think about going to a restaurant, we baked you know, our own bread, our own buns, we made our own Danish, our own donuts. Um, we did hot fudge cake, we did uh, sandwiches, soups, gravies, sauces, uh, glazes. So, so coming out of university to that type of job, it was amazing because I was able to learn about ice cream, frozen foods and fresh foods and um, processing of all kinds. And so I, I started in quality with them, but my boss, was a an R and D scientist who loved loved making sauces and, and developing soups and developing food products from a from a tiny kitchen batch, you know, scaling up to the to the big kettles in the in the process. So I was lucky enough to be able to work very closely with this gentleman, and um, and and he taught me everything that I needed to know about uh, uh, working with food in that type of scale. Plus he didn't like food. So I was able to do all the tasting and the testing. It's, it was amazing how much he could do without really tasting anything. You know, he was just a true scientist. Um, and that's really interesting because, so what would have been to his detriment without his, someone who had a great palate to be able to flavor check and just say, hey, you had a great idea as a scientist, but in practice, this is not gonna work. Exactly. Um, and as I hear you describing all of these homemade pastries and things, and, and we happen to be recording close to lunchtime right now, and I'm thinking, oh, that'd be a fantastic place to work. But I'm sure there were plenty of times where either um, what sounded good in scientific theory did not translate to the palate and, and um, the replication process relative to quality. Talk yeah. to us a bit about how you took that experience and then translated into what you do today relative to quality. Yeah, so quality systems was always the, the background of what I was doing. And the R&D started out as being sort of just help and advice um, from, a, from a mentor. And I moved to Butterball and I thought I was so naive because I thought, oh my gosh, we've gone from so many ingredients and so many different formulations down to this little plant that makes butter, basically, you know, I thought, oh, it'll just be simple. But from a quality perspective, it can have a tiny business and you can have a huge business and the regulations and the requirements are the same. So you need all the programs, the policies, the, um, the you know, the requirements are, are all need to be met um, at any size or scale of. So, so quality was my, my first um, experience here at Butterball as well. And then eventually over the years, I moved into an R&D role. And I enjoy having the quality background because I think when I speak with a customer, I can kind of lend some confidence and credibility um, knowing that who is manufacturing the product, what types of programs that we have in place to keep their, their brand uh, safe. And so I think that bringing that to the initial customer conversation prior to development and so forth gives folks uh, a good confidence about Butterball and, um, and it kind of closes the deal, I think, a little bit quicker. You know, and, and I would bet that so many of our listeners forget that that direct correlation between being able to assure a customer of consistent quality, of their expectations being met each and every time, because that's what quality obviously is about, right? Is it's not just that one spectacular finish, but can you spectacularly finish every single time? Every uh, time. And so bringing someone in with your expertise would certainly, if I was a customer, give me peace of mind knowing, hey, here's the science behind this. Here's what Lucia is looking after every time. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting when you mentioned, Lucia, about the, the requirements could be the same for a small business as a very large business. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it because of the food kind product itself? So in other words, when you said butter, I think dairy. Mm -hmm. um, does dairy have, for example, far more requirements than other food products or, or how does that work? Yeah, I think the requirements are basically the, the basic premise of manufacturing food is the same. Um, I think the meat industry has their own um, you know, their own risks and dairy has their own risks, but I think the general practices 
um, have to be followed no matter no matter what. If you're going to put food out for commerce, um, you have to follow the follow the rules. And I think it was we were talking the other day about rule following and and the the role of quality and so forth. And I think that one one important thing that I've learned over the course of time is that the best way to ensure quality is to have a quality mindset across the across the board across the, all the teams the quality is not a department it's a it's a mindset and it's a it's a practice and so um, and it's funny because the auditing firms that audit food companies now famous auditing firms that are um, you know very popular with with food companies have added food safety culture to their set of requirements. And only in the last like three or four, maybe five years at the most, all of the years before, it was all about all kinds of programs and practices and policies and things like that. And I think that we missed the point. In, well, they, I think that they do surveys and they say, okay, what happened at all of these different plants? What went wrong? What were the failures? And I think that over time, we realized that many of the failures are associated with a um, not having the appropriate quality mindset. So we're all in the industry now trying to, to have like measurement around quality culture. And that's essentially new, a new way of thinking about quality that, that we all didn't have before. I mean, I might've had it personally, but that was not an industry standard. Well, and I just took a note about what you said, because I love your statement about quality is not a department and it's a mindset and a practice because so having having come up in manufacturing as well i remember the metrics and and the qs 9000 audits and the, yeah. I, I i was one of those auditors and i'm yeah. thinking about all of those metrics and how they missed the whole point of what you are describing which is it has to be a whole culture where everyone is is looking at the same outcome rather than just does this metric fit within this parameter? Yes or no, move on. That's right. Um, and I think you and I, um, when we were, we were talking a little bit before the interview, I mentioned to you about coming up upon, I opened up Olives. Yeah. Uh, and I won't mention the brand, but it was a reputable, well-known brand. And for the first time in my entire life, I, I found blue and white spots all over black canned olives and was so grateful that I actually looked in the can before I yeah. shoved a few in my mouth, which is what I would have done normally and thought, I can't believe this has actually happened. And I have to think that that, that would be part of a cultural problem rather than a, because by the time the metric goes off and, and maybe if you'll speak to that a little bit, Lucia, about by the time the metric <clears throat> shows that something's wrong, how much product has generally gone through a system or how much waste is there? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And I think that every business has it a little bit different. I mean, you think about canning operation is, you know, is probably a very, you know, fast, especially a, a, a famous brand. I mean, it's probably a very fast operation. And there are checks and tests. Um, these days, things are very automated. So maybe those, you know, those checks need to be on a different frequency and so forth. But basically you're right. I said, I think in the old days, we used to have what was called quality control where we do a lot of like testing afterwards to make sure that all of the parameters were met and so forth. And then we started, started thinking about how we probably should start a little bit further back and, and put in quality assurance steps so that we know what we're going to do prior to doing it and, uh, and that we can, we can kind of plan in the quality versus testing it later. Um, my my fear is that your your olive producer, you know, um, all of that particular batch went bad, and I don't know if it was two thousand pounds or five thousand pounds, but it was probably a large amount that all suffered from that same you know issue that you saw. Um, tests hopefully could have been done ahead of of a practice versus trying to sort of test in the quality later on. Um, we, we're learning now that, that we have to start designing the products for quality manufacture. Um, and that's part of why I enjoy R&D because I think that it's, um, if you do it right, you can make sure that you're designing the product for manufacturability. And manufacturability means, you know, like you said, 
correct and perfect every time. Well, and I, I really appreciate that perspective of design it in ahead of time. And I think all of our listeners are cheering because I don't believe that that concept of design it in has ever been considered. You know that old joke about build it and they will come or build it and it can be forced to be manufactured. And then and then the, the um, upstream, if you will, of manufacturing just says, well, that's easy, just do it. And no one considers the impact or, or repercussions. And so I think it, it's so much more important if we design it ahead, that makes the job of manufacturing so much more easy. Um, That's right. and scalable and then we we are able to keep that culture intact just it kind of completes the circle so to speak right I think you're referencing reliability right so you you want to have a process that's reliable and the Absolutely. easiest way to have a reliable process is to design it for reliability and manufacturability so that you can give that confidence to that customer that that they're you're gonna they're gonna get that that reliable product, that product consistency that they're looking for. So when we were speaking earlier, Lucia, you had mentioned a, a concept about being a coach rather than the police department. And so <laughs> how would you coach the Olive folks at, rather than serving as a police department? And, and tell yeah. our viewers a little bit about this concept. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit afraid of your Olive story because that's a really kind of a serious one. And I, I would you know, you take a little breath and say, oof, you know, let that not be us, you know, but. Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but I find that it, it's a, it's an old fashioned, I think your, your viewers would probably agree with me. It's an old fashioned thought that the quality department, so to speak, is responsible for the product itself. Like, in other words, if that person wasn't on that, that quality team member wasn't on shift or if they didn't make it make it around for a check or whatever that that's the reason why a product would go bad when when the whole program needs to, to be designed where the process is being checked by the operators by the team leaders by the entire production team so that it's it's the quality people kind of answering questions and supporting and coaching and helping make decisions, but the practice of watching what we're doing and making quality product is part of the production operation. And that's, you know, why not utilize all the eyeballs <laughs> that are across the, you know, looking at the product versus one team member, you know, walking by every, you know, 30 minutes. I mean, it just, it just doesn't even make sense. So I think that in the old days, we used to rely quite heavily on the quality technician. And nowadays my thinking is that we need, uh, and I think that the auditors, these, you know, SQF and BRC, the main auditors in, in the food industry are understanding the same thing, that what are you doing as a business to encourage the mindset and the thought process around quality? hour in and hour out, moment by moment, um, so that everyone is, is representing um, the quality mindset in their, in their minute by minute work. <clears throat> and so when you describe that minute by minute work, it's very much a, a current state of now constantly, rather than when you reference the, the police mindset of an after the fact, and then it's repercussions for what was done wrong. That's but right it's too late then it, the that's damage right. is already done you've got wasted product and that's not yeah. not value to anyone you're right and then i don't find that to be encouraging like you you know you're not excited to work for a team when there's that that it, first of all you're not excited to report that something may have happened sure. so i think the the creating an environment of safety and trust is also very important that that the quality leads are trusted partners that you can go to and say, oh my gosh, I think something may have happened. Why don't we stop and think and, you know, make some, you know, make some decisions versus trying to hide, you know, because when you have those punitive, you know, uh, repercussions, folks tend to want to hide, tend to sure. want to cover over, tend to want to, and then those, those issues escape, right? And then when you have escapes, you have things like moldy olives at the end of the, you know, at the, at the grocery store or what, in your kitchen and so forth. So, yeah. No, and, and it's a wonderful point about 
it goes right back to the culture that you talked about early on relative to building an environment where people feel safe and secure and want to actively say, hey, wait a second. Yeah. Some something's gone gone off. Let's look at this right now. Yes. Stop before yes. um, it goes too far. And like you said, when it's not punitive and there's not repercussions for stopping anything, then people are encouraged. What's the worst that happens? They stop a process three or four times and ensure that the quality is exactly what you were expecting. It sounds like the right thing to do. It sure does to me. And I, yeah. it avoids all of those other negative impacts when quality does go off. Yeah, that's right. Now, now tell me a little bit about quality from a, a commercialization process. Do you, do you have a different perspective on that than what we've talked about so far? It's the same. I think commercialization, um, it, well, it's, it's kind of a passion of mine, like taking a, an item like my, my original boss did, you know, taking a, a kitchen item, um, a few, you know, a few t- tablespoons of this or that in the, on the bench top, and then making that to scale in a 2000 pound kettle, um, and then helping the people that are going to be producing it understand like, what is the, what is the goal? Like, how is this supposed to look? Um, we're working on a, on a caramel dessert right now. And, um, and so the, the gentlemen that are going to be actually making the product in production, you know, asked me yesterday, um, can we put the butter in before the caramel sauce? And, and I said, absolutely not. <laughs> because in the kitchen, um, I learned that the, to, in order to get a very rich color, the caramel has to go first. And so there, we kind of work together to figure out um, how, you know, how do we want the cusp, how do we want the final product to appear to the, to the end user in their kitchen? And how do we take it from my kitchen to the production floor and then to your kitchen um, and have it, you know, meet expectations? So that's, that's kind of a, I don't know, that kind of keeps me going, right? Um, after all these years, I think just the trial and error of, of bringing to life, uh, either whether it be a soup or a topping, or in this case, um, a butter flavor um, dessert product. Um, I think that it's, it's for me, one of the most exciting parts of the R&D process. And then the quality just kind of sneaks into everything that you do when, when you kind of grew up in that environment. So. And it sounds like it's a fun job, Lucia, because you, (laughs) every day is something different. And and I have to believe that it's impacted how you cook at home as well. You must be a fantastic cook from all you know, that you've learned and experienced. I know my husband would not agree with that because he thinks, you know what, by the time I'm immersed with food all day, you know, I'm kind of, I get a little like mm, lazy, you know, at home, but the products that we're working on now here at Butterball are that type of, you know, sort of speed scratch type of products where you'll take maybe noodles and chicken and then add a couple of our flavor portions and you've got a restaurant quality dish. So it's, it is fun in that sense, because I'm helping people at home uh, get kind of a, well, especially with COVID, right? We stayed home a lot. We made dishes, you know, more dishes than we did before, but I think these, um, you're, you're still cooking, but Mm -hmm. you don't have to have all the different ingredients. They come inside the, the butter sauce that I'm offering. So um, it's, we're, we're working on some pretty exciting products right now. I'm going to be looking for those myself, Lucia, because that sounds exactly like my kind of cooking, especially sure. on a weeknight after working yeah. all day. So I'll, I'll yep. be looking for those. Yeah, well, you should. You as should. we begin to, to close out here, Lucia, um, is there anything specific from a woman's viewpoint that mm. you have found um, 38 years is really commendable and extraordinary <laughs> in one field? Yeah. So I'm sure you've seen tremendous development and changes. Can you share that with us a bit? Yes, I, I, I talked, the most impactful thing I think is that quality culture thing that's really changed a lot from the, from the start of when I um, entered this, this industry. Um, I also feel that, that what women can bring to the table in terms of you know, team leaders and production managers and, and quality systems managers and uh, logistics folks and product planners and those types of things is that we do really have, I feel, a more holistic view. I think that um, 
a lot of times a woman wants to know what other departments are doing in order to see, you know, the full impact mm -hmm. of, of how our business is impacting our customers. And so I think that women are like unique in that sense that when they do try to problem solve, they, they problem solve in a more holistic manner. And, um, and, and I think that uh, over time, let's say, um, we've, we've realized that like, as an industry. And I think that we're trying to, we're utilizing our, our, our women to, to their greatest extent. Uh, um, I've met quite a few women, you know, at very high levels in, in my industry now. Um, I think when I started, it was not like that. So, um, but that's what I think that we bring to the table is, is the kind of a broader business practice, even when we're looking at a, at a small detail. <clears throat> well, it, and it's encouraging to hear you say that that is now becoming more of a standard because in, in executive management yourself, um, seeing that that's becoming more common with other women in executive roles, yeah. I think is critically important. And, and it brings that voice. And you and I spoke a bit about credibility for women as well. And I think that that also lends to the credibility in the voice and um, is so important. I agree. Well, Lucia, thank you so much for being my guest today. It was delightful to have you. A great chance to learn more about quality and R&D and your passion for both. So thank you so much. And for our listeners, remember to tune in for several of the other broadcasts that we have available to you from Jacket Media Company. We have Hazard Girls and Hazard Girls highlights difficult and dangerous positions for women in unusual roles in manufacturing. We have Manufacturing Matters with Cliff Waldman. And last but not least, we have, of course, uh, the WAM podcast and Manufacturing Talk Radio. So with that, thank you all for listening. <laughs>